The Lives of the Saints by the Reverend Alban Butler, taken from the fourth edition, published in 1954. January 21st, St. Agnes. St. Jerome says that the tongues and pens of all nations are employed in the praises of this saint who overcame both the cruelty of the tyrant and the tenderness of her age and crowned the glory of chastity with that of martyrdom. St. Austin observes that her name signifies chaste in Greek and a lamp in Latin. She has always been looked upon in the church as a special patroness of purity with the Immaculate Mother of God and St. Tecla. Rome was the theater of the triumph of St. Agnes and Prudentius says that her tomb was shown within sight of that city. She suffered not long after the beginning of the persecution of Diocletian whose bloody edicts appeared in March in the year of our Lord 303. We learn from St. Ambrose and St. Austin that she was only 13 years of age at the time of her glorious death. Her riches and beauty excited the young noblemen of the first families in Rome to vie with one another in their dresses who should gain her in marriage. Agnes answered them all that she had consecrated her virginity to her heavenly spouse who could not be beheld by mortal eyes. Her suitors, finding her resolution impregnable to all their arts and importunities, accused her to the governor as a Christian, not doubting but threats and torments would overcome her tender mind on which allurements could make no impression. The judge at first employed the mildest expression and most inviting promises to which Agnes paid no regard repeating always that she could have no other spouse than Jesus Christ. He then made use of threats, but found her soul endowed with a masculine courage and even desirous of wrecks and death. At last terrible fires were made, and iron hooks, racks and other instruments of torture displayed before her with threats of immediate execution. The young virgin surveyed them all with an undaunted eye and with a cheerful countenance beheld the fierce and cruel executioners surrounding her and ready to dispatch her at the word of command. She was so far from betraying the least symptom of fear that she even expressed her joy at the sight and offered herself to the wreck. She was then dragged before the idols and commanded to offer incense, but could by no means be compelled to move her hand except to make the sign of the cross says St. Ambrose. The governor, seeing his measures ineffectual, said he would send her to a house of prostitution where what she prized so highly should be exposed to the insults of the devotees. Agnes answered that Jesus Christ was too jealous of the purity of his spouses to suffer it to be violated in such a manner, for he was their defender and protector. You may, said she, stain your sword with my blood, but will never be able to profane my body, consecrated to Christ. The governor was so incensed at this that he ordered her to be immediately led to the public brothel with liberty to all persons to abuse her person at pleasure. Many young profligates ran thither, full of the wicked desire of gratifying their lust, but were seized with such awe at the sight of the saint that they durst not approach her. One only accepted who, attempting to be rude to her, was that very instant, by a flash, as it were, of lightning from heaven struck blind and fell trembling to the ground. His companions, terrified, took him up and carried him to Agnes, who was at a distance singing hymns of praise to Christ, her protector. The virgin by prayer restored him to his sight and health. The chief prosecutor of the saint, who had first sought to gratify his lust and avarice, now labored to satiate his revenge by incensing the judge against her, his passionate fondness being changed into anger and rage. The governor wanted not others to spur him on, for he was highly exasperated to see himself baffled and set a defiance by one of her tender age and sex. Therefore, resolved upon her death, he condemned her to be beheaded. Agnes, transported with joy on hearing this sentence, and still more at the sight of her executioner, went to the place of execution more cheerfully, says St. Ambrose, than others go to their wedding. The executioner had secret instruction to use all means to induce her to a compliance, 
but Agnes always answered she could never offer so great an injury to her heavenly spouse, and having made a short prayer, bowed down her neck to adore God and received the stroke of death. The spectators wept to see so beautiful and tender a virgin loaded with fetters and to behold her fearless under the very sword of the executioner, who with a trembling hand cut off her head at one stroke. Her body was buried at a small distance from Rome, near the Nomitan Road. A church was built on the spot in the time of Constantine the Great and was repaired by Pope Honorius in the 7th century. It is now in the hands of canon regulars, standing without the walls of Rome, and is honored with her relics in a very rich silver shrine, the gift of Pope Paul V, in whose time they were found in this church, together with those of St. Emerentiana. The other beautiful rich church of St. Agnes, within the city built by Pope Innocent X, the right of patronage being vested in the family of Pamphili, stands on the place where her chastity was exposed. The feast of St. Agnes is mentioned in all my theologies, both of the East and West, though on different days. It was formerly a holiday for the women in England, as appears from the Council of Worcester, held in the year 1240. St. Ambrose, St. Austin and other fathers have wrote her panegyric. St. Martin of Tours was singularly devout to her. Thomas Akempis honored her as his special patroness, as his works declare in many places. He relates many miracles wrought and graces received through her intercession. Marriage is a holy state instituted by God and in the order of providence and nature the general or more ordinary state of those who live in the world. Those, therefore, who upon motives of virtue and in a Christian and holy manner engage in this state do, do well. Those nevertheless who, for the sake of practicing more perfect virtue, by a divine call, prefer a state of perpetual virginity, embrace that which is more perfect and more excellent. Dr. Wells, a learned Protestant, confesses that Christ declares voluntarily chastity for the kingdom of heaven's sake to be an excellency and an excellent state of life. This is also the manifest inspired doctrine of St. Paul and in the revelations of St. John, Spotless virgins are called, in a particular manner, the companions of the Lamb, and are said to enjoy the singular privilege of following him wherever he goes. The tradition of the Church has always been unanimous in this point, and among the Romans, Greeks, Syrians and barbarians, many holy virgins joyfully preferred torments and death to the violation of their integrity, which they bound themselves by vow to preserve without defilement in mind or body. The fathers, from the very disciples of the apostles, are all profuse in extolling the excellency of holy virginity as a special fruit of the incarnation of Christ, his divine institution, and a virtue which has particular charms in the eyes of God, who delights in chaste minds and chooses to dwell singularly in them. They often repeat that purity raises men, even in this mortal life, to the dignity of angels, purifies the soul, fits it for a more perfect love of God and a closer application to heavenly things and disengages the mind and heart from worldly thoughts and affections. It produces in the soul the nearest resemblance to God. Chastity is threefold, that of virgins, that of widows and that of married persons. In each state it will receive its crown, as St. Ambrose observes, but in the first is most perfect so that St. Austin calls it fruit a hundredfold, and it of marriage sixtyfold. But the more excellent this virtue is, and the higher its glory and reward, the more heroic and the more difficult is its victory. Nor is it perfect unless it be embellished with all other virtues in a heroic degree, especially divine charity and the most profound humility. <laughs>